Amen. If I haven't had a chance to meet you, I go by Ant. I get the privilege of serving as the pastor here at Midtown Two Notch. I see we have some guests with us today. Thank you all so much for joining us and being here to worship with us this morning. Amen. We're really glad to have you uh, here with us. So as we continue through this sermon series that we're entitling uh, in Christ. So this is the second week of this series. Just to give you a heads up, we're still going to be a little bit big picture with the sermon uh, today. We want to get more into some of the practicals and specifics of how all this fleshes itself out in our lives uh, in the following uh, five weeks. So I want you to do me a favor to get our time set up for together, set up together today. Excuse me. Uh, if you have something to write on, if you have a device with you that you can use, I would love for you to do start with a little exercise for me. If you can start by writing down or maybe typing in your phone or whatever you have. How would you describe yourself? It can just be one word, answers, maybe put a few words down. If someone were to ask you, who are you? What would you say? How would you describe yourself to them? If you were to identify yourself to someone, what words would you use? This is actually a question that we often ask uh, at the beginning of our of a series of uh, what we call recovery uh, in our church. It's a uh, it's a ministry that we have really across our family of churches with our downtown church and our Lexington church, uh, where people who are who are seeking to to overcome something that just feels defeated, or that feels like it is defeating them, or or like they can't overcome it in their lives. Uh, recovery is a ministry uh, that we often invite people to join when that is the case. And one of the things we, that we do in recovery in the first week of this series of weeks, is we ask them, give us a word that describes you. And even this past recovery cycle that we started, I believe in January or February, some of the things that people said were slave. Some people put unredeemable. There were some who put broken beyond repair. There were some who put victim, hopeless, even damaged goods. And I can't help but believe, and my guess is you would agree with me, that if we have that type of perception of ourselves, it will affect the way that we live. It will affect the way we experience life. It will affect our relationship with God. That how we, ident how we identify ourselves is extremely important to us. I just can't help but believe that if we believe those types of narratives about ourselves, it will lead to, to, to increasing pain and hurt and despair. Today, we want to focus on how being in Christ gives us a new identity. And to start us off, I want to show us what the Bible actually sets as an alternative to being in Christ. So if you were with us last week, you know, you know, I talked about us being in Christ and a little bit of what that means. But really, the Bible sets in Christ in opposition to something else that was true for all of us before we placed faith in Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting at verse 21. Reads, for as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. And then he's going to explain in verse 22 who these two men are he's referring to. Verse 22, for as in Adam all die, that's the first man, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Now the Apostle Paul is making an argument about the resurrection of Jesus. In this chapter, he's talking about how our faith is futile without the resurrection of Jesus. So that's why he brings up the, one of the reasons he brings up the resurrection here. What I want to draw our attention to today, specifically from verse 22, is how he says, For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. You ever, I don't know if you've ever seen uh, the post on, on social media where it often says, Well, there's two types of people in the world, right? And it gives you different descriptions. Like uh, the one that I resonate with the most is there's, uh, there, there are people who look at their gas tank being almost empty and say, oh, I need to stop and get some gas. And there are some people who look at it, yours truly, and be like, I know my car. Okay. So there's two different types of people in the world. There's no overlap. You're one, of the, you're one or the other. What the Apostle Paul is showing us here in verse 22 is that there are two kinds of people, two categories of people in the world. There are those who are in Adam, and there are those who are in Christ. And it's not just here, it's in other places throughout Scripture that we won't take the time to get into today. But this is one of the themes of Paul's writing here is that he, he, he shows the contrast between what it means to be in Adam and what it means to be in Christ. He even go, even in this, in this same chapter, he refers uh, to, to Jesus as the second Adam. And we can either be in our first grandfather, Adam, or we can be in 
Christ. Last week, we unpacked a theological concept, obviously, that we call our union with Christ, how our, how our life is bound with his life, such that everything that is his has become our own. His righteousness, his status as a child of God, his death and resurrection, those have become our own. And we'll flesh those out more in the coming weeks. But as I said earlier, we have not always been in Christ. In fact, if you are a believer, but before the Holy Spirit opened your eyes, you were actually someone else. You were categorically different. Your identity was different. You were in Adam. We said last week that our life has been united and bound to Christ's life. And the point that I'm making now is that prior to that, and for anyone who has not placed faith in Christ, our life is bound with Adam's life. That what is true of him is also true of us in many ways. And if you're familiar with what happened and what Adam did and the role that Adam has played in all of history, you might know that that's not a great thing. Adam was our first ancestor. He listened to the devil in the Garden of Eden. As the devil was calling him to doubt God's love for him, to doubt God's intentions for him. He he sought to to replace God, as it were, on the throne, maybe even of of his own heart. He sought to be able to to govern his own self. He didn't want to be under God's dominion and be led by God. So he sins against God. He's rightly judged and punished by God for his sin. He's separated from his ability to enjoy that connection with God that he had before because of his guilt. We notice that he he and his wife didn't experience shame because of their sin. And Paul is saying that outside of Christ, we are in him. We are connected to him. That so much of what is true of him is also deeply and truly the case for us. Here's how the apostle Paul talks about it in Romans chapter 5, verse 19. He says, for as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. That one man obviously is Adam. Sin. Because of his disobedience, because of his sin, now we have inherited sin. We now have a sinful nature. We now have become sinners because of our union and our connection with Adam, because we are in him, obviously apart from Christ. Because of our first grandfathers, as if he, through, through the generational lines, he has passed this nature down to us. And I would argue that out of all the different things that we use to define us. Family, our family, the people we belong to, oftentimes just might define us more than anything else. In fact, I guess that a lot of the things that you wrote down on your list were in some way connected to the relationships with those who you consider to be family. Give you a personal story. So I'm a second generation preacher. My dad's a preacher. And uh, I remember when I first started really preaching uh, the word of God, I preached some at the church that he he was a pastor then and continues to pastor now. And I remember uh, one of the members coming up to me after the service and saying, that apple ain't falling far from the tree. Another member who was there at the time said, no, 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 that apple's still on the tree. (laughs) That apple is still very much connected to the tree. What were they saying? They were saying, I see some of your dad's nature in you. I see some of his gifting in you. I see some of the way he lives, the way he responds, the way he teaches. I see those in you. Those things have been passed down to you. He has rubbed off on you. I can see the connection that you have with him. Your dad's character, your dad's life is a part of you. You've picked up on some of his traits. They're saying you're actually a lot like him. My mom has said to me many times when when noticing something that I've done, she's like, you know, that's exactly what your dad would do. I think that's probably what your dad would have said in this moment. And some parents here might relate, but I actually find myself saying the exact same thing. I'm talking about word for word to my kids that my parents said to me. Things my mom said, things my dad said, things that I didn't didn't even realize I was saying. It's like I I wasn't even trying to say what I had heard from them. It was just coming out of my mouth, and I was trying to catch it as it was coming out because I'm like, no, I'm going to be a different parent from my my parents. I'm going to do it differently. I ain't going to say that to my kids. Next thing you know, because I said so. (laughs) Because I said so. I see it coming out of me. I see it as it is a part of me. 
And one way to look at what the Bible says about us and our connection with Adam is that the same is true for us. That apple hasn't fallen far from the tree. That many of the things that we know from the Bible to be true of Adam are also true of us. Here's the truth. The people we are most connected to shape who we become. The people we are most connected to shape who we become. I remember just recently, my wife was telling me how one of our children is so much like her. It's just like her. The people we are most connected to shape who we become. For some of us, who we are today is maybe a direct contrast to our parents. For some of us, we're a lot like our parents. That's me. For some of us, we saw some things from our parents and we've committed a lot of our lives to saying we're not going to be that way. Either way, those you're most connected to shape who we are. They shape who we are. It's it's like it's it's in our bones. It's like it was passed down to us like, like genetics through our bloodstream. One of the things I remember my dad saying to me when I was leaving the house to go to college, I think maybe for the first time, Remember him saying, remember who you are and remember whose you are. He said, remember who you are and remember whose you are. He was connecting the, the family that I belong to. And I believe for him, he was talking about our family, the Frederick family, but also I think he was talking about our connection with, with Christ as well and belonging to him. But either way, he was connecting who I am with who I belong to in, 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 the, in the hope and the prayer and the desire and the belief that that would then shape the way that I live that I would shape how I respond in different situations, how I act, how I behave. He knew that who I was was inside of me and would guide me. You see, apart from Christ, Adam lives in us. Adam lives in, he's, he's in our bones. What he did, that decision that he made, it is a part of us now. This is what many theologians would call the Christian doctrine of original sin, or some call it depravity. It's like a genetic trait throughout humanity's bloodline. The apple still doesn't fall far from the tree. And for what it's worth, I will go as far as to say this is actually what is wrong with the world today. What is wrong with the world? Hear me on this because this is an important part of not only this, this message, but our understanding of what our problem is. That means what is really wrong with us is not simply what we do, but who we are. I'm saying that it's an identity issue. It is who we are because of Adam. What is wrong with the world is that apart from Christ, we have an identity that is broken. And because of that, we continue to both experience and in many ways further and cause the brokenness in our world. And when I say our identity is broken, it's like a house that has problems with the foundation of it. Yes, you're going to see maybe a lot of different problems within the house, You're going to see a lot of symptoms of those problems, but ultimately the problem is at the foundation. The problem is underneath everything else that we are seeing. And in Adam, our identity is broken. We have an identity problem. Like Adam, we believe Satan's lies about ourselves and about others and about God. Like Adam, we desire to be in charge of our lives and not submit to God. Like Adam, we believe that we know more than God does. Like Adam, we believe that God is withholding good from us, so we rebel against him and try to pursue and seek after the things that we believe he is holding out on us, the things that he is withholding from us. We believe that those things are actually better for us than the things that God ascribes for us. Adam is in our bones. Adam is in our bones. And I would say... When I say this is what is really wrong with the world, maybe a better way for me to say it is I believe that this is the problem that is behind all other problems. We're in Adam and sin, missing the mark of who God created us to be. is not just what we do, but it is a part of who we are because we are in Adam. I'll try to give some examples of why I say this is at the root of everything else. Um, When people oftentimes talk about incarceration rates in our country, A lot of people talk about, when we talk about solutions to those things, a lot of people talk about education and that type of thing. And education is great and it's vital and it's necessary and it's important and we need education 100%. But but also what I'm trying to say, when we understand 
that what the problem is that's underneath all the other problems, that us, us being in Adam, we'd, we'd be able to see and be able to understand that all other solutions don't quite solve the root issue. Because education is great, but there are a lot of educated people that commit a lot of crime as well. Education is great, but it, did, it doesn't get underneath the biggest issue that we have. I mean, if you think about Germany and all the problems that Germany caused in World War II, it was seen as one of the, one of the, the pinnacles of education in our world. Education is good. I don't, wanna, I don't want you to hear me saying I'm putting down education. The point that I'm making is every solution that this world offers is oftentimes dealing with the symptom and not the root of the problem. I'll try to give you another example. Oftentimes, and this is something that... Um, this is a thought process that I often have uh, as well. Oftentimes when, uh, when there's people who uh, are family together, maybe they're married, maybe sometimes uh, parents and children, when there's a lot of relational conflict and problems, oftentimes uh, we want to try to get them tools to help them deal with their relationship and all that. And those tools are very important and very helpful and very necessary. And I try to apply a lot of those tools to my life. So I'm not trying to knock those things. But I believe even some of the best therapists that you would ever talk to would say, I can give all the tools to, to, to this, this group of people or, this, or these two people to have this relationship uh, with each other, but if they don't deep down in their hearts have a desire to make it work, if they don't have a desire to endure in love with the other, it's limited. All the best tools in the world are limited because the problem runs deeper than what worldly means are able to solve. And as I've said earlier, the problem is that we are in Adam. And oftentimes the problem is because Adam, he, he's, it's as if he continues to live on in us. The problems of things like selfishness, it is rooted, selfishness and pride, oftentimes it gets in the way in our relationships. It's rooted in our broken identity in Adam. I'll tell you the way Martin Luther King Jr. talked about it. He said, there is something wrong with our world something fundamentally and basically wrong. I don't think we have to look too far to see that. And when we stop to analyze the cause of our world's ills, many things come to mind. We begin to wonder if it is due to the fact that we don't know enough. But it can't be that because in terms of accumulated knowledge, we know more today than men have known in any period of human history. It can't be because man is stagnant in his scientific progress. Man's scientific genius has been amazing. I think we have to look much deeper than that. If we are to find the real cause of man's problems and the real cause of the world's ills today, if we are to really find it, I think we will have to look into the hearts and souls of men. We lived in a time, obviously, of such brokenness and bigotry and overt racism. And he sees all of it. And he says, the problem is us. It is within us. You can find it in our souls. We have a broken identity. And this is why we have this tendency towards self, things like selfishness being over, and being over, overly excuse me, harsh with others. Things like being passive and not stepping up and serving and helping in ways that we should. This is why we have a tendency of hurting, even hurting the ones that we love the most. This is why we have tendencies towards insecurity and shame. And I know some of those things can come from things that have happened to us in our past, maybe as we've grown up. But if we're going to be honest about it, even if you grew up in the, in the most functional, most well-run family ever, you still have insecurities and things that are going on with you. Why? Because it's deeper than just our past experiences. It's deeper than just what has happened to us in our lifetime. But it is also because what has been passed down to us. We have a broken and flawed Identity. All right, why would I make such a big deal about this? Why does all of this matter? Why would I take time, take so much time telling you about what's wrong with you? Why would I do that? Here's why. Here's one of the reasons I think that's important. Uh, this was earlier on in, in my marriage. Uh, my wife was sick, and uh, she had the, the cough and things like that. So we're thinking she had a cold. So I think we just gave her like some, uh, some cold medicine and things like that. And some of the, whim some of the symptoms uh, went away or at least greatly decreased. But they never fully went away for an extended period of time. After a while, after they continued for a while, I ended up sending her, or she ended up going, I should say, to the doctor's uh, office uh, to kind of get, get it checked out and see what's going on. 
found out that she actually had, I believe it was bronchitis that led to pneumonia at the time. And so we were treating it as if it were just a cold, giving maybe cough syrup and cough medicine and things like that, when what she actually needed was antibiotics because she had pneumonia. And one thing that I found that I realized at that point is that if you don't actually have a proper diagnosis of what is wrong, you end up treating symptoms and not actually treating the root of the problem. That if we don't understand what the fundamental problem underneath all the other problems, if we didn't understand what the problem was beneath the cough, beneath the sore throat and all of that, then we would go about trying to solve problems in, in, in us, in our world, in a way that doesn't, isn't actually sufficient. And not only that, you will fail to appreciate the actual solution. If before that time, you would have walked to my house with the, with the, with the best anti, with the antibiotics necessary to treat pneumonia, and you would have put it in my house. I'd be like, I don't care anything about that. I don't, I, don't, I don't need this. This doesn't mean anything to me. This doesn't affect us at all. But when we had a proper diagnosis and a proper understanding of what's actually going on, now I'm thankful for it. Now I appreciate it. Now I'm glad that we have this solution, this medicine that we have. And there is a narrative today that many believe in that teaches us what you really need to do to fix the problems with yourself is look deep within, within yourself. What you really need to do is look within yourself and find the strength that you need to get past this, to change, to be better than this. What you really need to do is examine deep inside yourself, look into you and find what you need because it's there. You're strong enough, you're good enough, you're whatever enough to fix whatever this problem is within you. And that makes sense if what's wrong with us is rooted in all the things that maybe someone else has done to us or things that we've experienced. But as I've been making the case for, that would be a misdiagnosis. The truth is a big part of the problem, and the big part of the problem in our world, and, and many of us individually, or all of us individually, apart from Christ, is that when we look deep inside of us, we find the problem. That that's actually where the problem lives. That that's where the problem resides. I need something or someone outside of me to fix what's wrong with me. I need a healer. I need a savior. I need a helper. I need a redeemer. I need someone who is righteous and good to come and make me new and give me a new identity. I need to be made new. I don't need to just look inside myself and, and self-actualize myself into being what I, what I want to be or what I desire to be. No, I need to be transformed by someone that is greater than me. I need something outside of me to come and make me new. Our, our, our identity, excuse me, in Adam doesn't just produce, and it doesn't just produce moral failure and unrighteous acts, but because of our sin, because our sin is a part of who we are in Adam, it also produces feelings of self-condemnation, and eventually us being in Adam produces eternal condemnation under the judgment of God. We need to be made new. Because sin is such a part of us. It's such a part of who we are that the sin that needs to be judged, because sin needs to be judged, we, need to, we are judged or we will be judged by a holy and righteous God if we are in Adam. And since the problem is something we've inherited, we need a new inheritance. And since the problem is in our blood, we need new blood. If the problem is a part of who we are, then we need to be made into someone new. And praise be to God that that is the very thing that Jesus came to do. I want to read that again from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It says, For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. You see, Jesus has come to undo what Adam did. For everywhere that Adam failed... Christ, on the other hand, succeeded. Whereas Adam turned from the Father in the garden, Jesus turned to the Father in the garden of Gethsemane. Where Adam succumbed to the enemy's lies, Jesus overcame them with God's truth. Where Adam was naked and, and, was naked and ashamed in the garden, or naked and unashamed in the garden, I should say, Jesus was naked and bore our shame on the cross. While Adam's sin brought thorns to us, Jesus wore a crown of thorns for us. Where Adam was a man that tried to substitute himself into God's place on the throne, Jesus was God and came to substitute himself in our place on the cross. Where Adam sinned at a tree, Jesus bore our sins on a tree. And while Adam died as a sinner, Jesus died for sinners. 
And Paul's whole point here is that all that Jesus is and has done and accomplished is now ours and is now a part of who we are. That, as I said earlier, what, what Adam had done became a part of who we are. was a part of us. And now what Jesus has done for us and now, has now become a part of who we are. We have a new identity in Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17 says it very plainly. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And we live in a world today where so many are searching to find out, who am I? Who exactly am I? I actually think this is one of the reasons why so many in our culture today love these personality tests that are coming out. There's so many of them that are out there. I want to know who I am. I want to know what I'm like. I want you to tell me about myself. It's like we're crying out. Somebody tell me who I am. And I'm here to tell you today that Jesus came to tell you exactly who you are. He came to make you very aware of who you are, what your purpose is in this life, what you were designed and created to do. He came to let you know who you are. If you're a believer in Jesus, you are holy and blameless before God. That's who you are. That is who you are. If you are a believer in Jesus, you are a child of the living God. That's who you are. If you are a believer of Jesus, you are forgiven and you are redeemed. That is a part of who you are now and no one can take that away from you. That is who you are. If you are a follower of Jesus, then you are, you are an heir to his kingdom. If you are a follower of Jesus, you are a citizen in his kingdom forever. If you are a follower of Jesus, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. These things are true. This is who you are. And here's what else is true about you. If you are in Jesus, that means now you're connected to a new tree. Because of the righteousness of Jesus that has now been made yours, you, you are the apple that hasn't fallen far from that tree now. That he has now given you his righteousness and allowing you to live out and walk in his righteousness in this life. Your apple falls near his tree now, not Adam's. Not primarily your parents or any other proverbial tree out there, but Jesus. If you are in Christ, when you strip away everything else, this is who you are. And I got to ask you, or at least I want to ask you to examine the list that you made in the, in the beginning of our time together. And I just wonder if all the things that are true of you in Christ came to mind when I asked you at the beginning of this message about who you identify yourself to be. I just got to ask you, when you were thinking about who you are, if, if what we read in Ephesians chapter 1 all through last week, if any of the things that we saw that were true about us, if those things come to your mind, one of the ways that you can know whether or not you actually believe and have embraced the reality that you are made new in Christ is whether or not when you think of yourself, you think about the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ. That's who you are now. Will you think of yourself that way? Will you see yourself that way? Holy and blameless is who we are now as the people of God. Children of God, that's who we are now. One of my concerns is that we build we would build our view of our own identity based on things that can be taken away from us. If you put your job on there, if the, or maybe if, if your job is one of the primary ways you think about who you are, that can be taken away from you. If relationships with certain people are one of the things that determine for you who you are, that can be taken away from you. I'm worried that we're building the foundation of our identity on sinking sand that will not stand, that will not stand the test of time, that will not last forever and leave you completely lost and hopeless and wondering and trying to figure out exactly who you are. Do you know how many people, when they lose their jobs, they're not just sad because they lost their income, but they're sad because they lost their identity? They don't know who they are now. You know how many people, when they lose a certain relationship with someone, they're sad, not just because they're grieving the loss of a person, but they're grieving the loss of their identity. That's how they saw themselves. That's how they viewed themselves. And if we understand this, if we understand how futile so, and fleeting so many of these things we base our identity off of, if we understand how, how, how ultimately they don't, they don't hold the weight that we desire for them to hold, it helps us to cherish Christ more. It helps us to cherish the identity that we have in him more because what he has given us, the spiritual blessings we talked about last week, cannot be taken away from you. They are solid ground. You can build your life on them and they will never let you down. 
so long as you are in Christ. It's an identity that cannot be taken away. Much of the Christian life is actually learning to live out or live as who we already are. To live up into whom he has made us to be. He declares us righteous. Now I'm learning to live as someone who is righteous. He declared us to be children of God. I'm learning to live what it means to live as a child of God. Let me try to give you an example. I know I'm talking a lot about my preaching today. When I first started, um, probably a little bit later after I first, even well, actually a few years after I started preaching, for whatever reason, I didn't see myself as a preacher, so to speak. I remember even saying, doing weird stuff, like saying, like, I'm going to go give a talk. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go give a talk. I'm not giving a sermon. just a talk about Jesus. Well, I'm probably going to proclaim the word of God. But it's just a talk, right? I think it's because I held the, the preacher to a certain, on a certain pedestal, to a certain standard or whatever. So I kind of felt like I was this imposter, right? That's an identity issue. And I remember someone that was in my life group. This is even before Midtown Two Notch got started when I was at Midtown Downtown. And someone in my life group was like, Brother, this is who you are. This is who you are. You're a preacher. It's okay. He said, man, this is who you are. Matter of fact, he said, embrace it, brother. Embrace it. He said, this is who you are. And really, God used his words and a few other things to really help me grow and be more and more comfortable. Because, see, I was shying away from living into what God was calling me into because I didn't see myself as such. Because I didn't understand that to be my identity. And I just believe oftentimes as Christians, we don't live into what God is calling us to live into because we don't see ourselves that way. We see ourselves in the same way as some of those words I talked about from those who were in recovery from this past cycle. We see ourselves as damaged. Let me say it another way. One of the things that is true about us is that we all sin. And you could say we're all sinners saved by grace. But if you view yourself more as a sinner than someone who has redeemed, then you are, you are elevating the, 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 the position of being in Adam over the position of being in Christ. If you see yourself more as a sinner than someone who's been made new in Christ, then, then what is probably happening in your life is you probably feel helpless and hopeless in your fight against sin because that's how you identify yourself. This is just who I am. I'm a sinner. I wonder if when we say sinner saved by grace, which one we're emphasizing more, which one we believe defines us more. And the truth of the matter is if you are in Christ, you are defined more by Christ than you ever were by Adam. You are more linked to Christ than you ever linked to Adam. That is who you are now. Will you see yourself that way? I feel like God is saying to us, holy and blameless and righteous is who you are. Embrace it. Embrace it. This is who you are. At the, at the end of the last recovery cycle, in the last night of recovery, everyone is given the opportunity to go around and share what their new word is. So you're going to and sharing, this, this, this is how I see myself. And for anyone who's guys been in work in their life, and the question is, how do you see yourself now? And a few weeks ago, we just finished up the spring recovery cycle, and folks, people got to share. One person said, I walked into recovery feeling like a victim of, of assault. My word was victim, and that I was totally broken. But now I know I am redeemed and whole in Christ. This is what it means to embrace the new identity of who we are in Jesus Christ. Another person said, I walked into recovery a slave. My word was slave, but now I know I have freedom in Christ to repent and believe in the gospel. This is what it means to understand and be transformed and know that we have a new identity now in Christ. So when you don't feel like you're a new creation, I hope you hear God saying, this is who you are now. Embrace it. So we don't feel like you are homely and blameless. I hope you hear God saying, no, this is who you are now. Embrace it. When you, when you don't feel like you're a child of the living God, when you don't feel like you're forgiven and redeemed, when you don't feel like when the enemy is whispering to you that you haven't been made new, you're still the same person that you've always been. I hope you hear the Spirit of God whispering to you now. No, this is who you are now. You've been made new. Embrace it. When you feel like your sin and guilt is too much for you, when you tend to condemn yourself, and when the devil tries to make you feel like you're still in Adam, I hope you hear God reminding you that that, that, that used to be true of you, but you're in Christ now. This is who you are. Embrace it. 
Family, we want to spend the next five weeks of this series going into the, the specifics about how to embrace our new identity in Christ or some of the new aspects of our identity that we're going to fight to embrace together. And I'm looking forward to being changed as we are reminded of who we are and whose we are. It's my prayer that you'll continue to join us as we continue to work our way through this series. Family, will you pray with me?